Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to talk about life in the cold and the incredible way that one species manages to not freeze to death in the mountains. Generally, organisms can avoid freezing in a few basic ways. They can avoid it through behavior. So think about bears hibernating or ice worms burrowing into a glacier to avoid inhospitable conditions. Or some species use biochemistry paired with evolution to not freeze. So an example of this is the ice fish that lives in the waters around Antarctica. This fish has these specialized proteins called antifreeze proteins that circulate to, throughout their body and physically bind to ice crystals as they form. And this prevents those ice crystals from progressing further and freezing the fish to death. Then there are species that do completely insane things. Meet the snowfly. This little insect happily roams around high mountain, snowy, ice cold landscapes when most other species are either burrowed under the snow, avoiding the cold, or they've bailed to warmer conditions at lower elevation. By remaining active at the snow surface throughout the winter, the overarching risk to snowfly survival isn't predation, it's freezing to death. So what do snowflies do that warrants an entire video about them? Well, they literally cut their leg off if it starts to freeze, seriously. And they can do this multiple times throughout their lives. And before you ask, no, the legs don't regenerate. They just ditch them to stay alive. We're gonna dig into the extreme biology of snowflies, the incredible way they avoid freezing and how it was discovered with Dr. John Tuthill. John is a neuroscientist at the University of Washington. And as you'll hear, him and his team were uniquely positioned to study the snowfly and also discover this incredible behavior. All right, let's bring in John. Hey, Scott. Hey, John. How um, are you? I'm soaking wet. I just ran into the rain. I'm just going to change really quick, and I'll be right back. Yeah, that's, that's totally fine. You got caught in the rain? Well, I mean, I, I live in Seattle, as you know. It's, this time of year, you're always kind of caught in the rain. But it's snowing yeah. in the mountains, so... Do you want to just say your name and where you work? Sure. Yeah, my name is John Tothill, and I'm a professor at the University of Washington. And what, is, what does your lab primarily do? So I'm in a department of neurobiology and biophysics, and I'm primarily a neuroscientist. So primarily meaning everybody in my lab, all 15 or 16 people except for me, um, work on how the brain encodes um, how the body moves and is positioned in space, the sense of proprioception, um, and then also how the brain kind of takes proprioception and controls the body. So, um, and we do that using uh, the fruit fly Drosophila. Because of that, you're probably uniquely positioned to do stuff like you've been doing with snowflies. Like you're, Maybe. Yeah, you're I mean, used to working on small things and trying to yes. quantify what they're doing. Yeah, we're set up to do behavior experiments and be very quantitative. So how did you get interested in snowflies? Where did this come from? Well, I got interested um, because, as I said, I have worked on how the fruit, fruit fly brain operates for, I don't know, 10 or 15 years now. And I also, in my free time, um, spend a lot of time um, back after skiing and mountaineering. And I just noticed that there were these insects out walking around in these extremely inhospitable alpine zones when people think about what it takes to survive in the Alpine in the winter, um, like, like with ice worms and glaciers, you, you have to consider that there's a lot of buffering of the temperature by the mm -hmm. snowpack. And so basically there are, I mean, there are tons of insects in the subnivian zone under the snowpack who yeah. are happily surviving, but yeah. it's a relatively consistent place. If you then emerge and wander around on top of the snowpack, that's when it gets pretty gnarly. Yeah. There aren't much, there's not much in the way of predators. There's not a lot of strong selection for avoiding predation. What there is is strong selection to not die in the cold. And mm -hmm. so whether it's behavioral or in this case, self amputating a leg, if it starts to freeze, like that is not a response to a predator. That is definitely a response to the environment itself, which maybe is the top predator in many ways. And yeah. That's what I think about system. it, too, is the, the cold is the predator. So tell me about this self-amputating leg freezing behavior. Sure. So a lot of insects um, and vertebrates will 
um, self-amputate their limbs when they're in danger. So the technical term for this is autotomy. Um, and they have like lizards, you grab their tail and their tail will pop off. And so they tend to have kind of specialized joints that they can just release the limb with. Crane flies, which are related to snow flies, have this ability to amputate their legs, probably for when a predator grabs onto them. Um, they have these big spindly legs, predator will grab their leg and they can release it to get away from the predator. We found Dominic, so Dominic Golding was the undergrad working in my lab who was studying snow flies. And what, what we were doing was just measuring how cold it can be for them to still keep moving. So we would lower the temperature in this little chamber and then measure their internal temperature with a thermal camera and just ask like, what is the point at which they stop moving? Because they're out in the cold, we just want to know what is the limit. Yeah. And so Dominic noticed that sometimes the, the cold plate would get cold enough that their legs would freeze. And you could see this, the, really, the key was really the thermal camera. You could see ice formation happening in the tips of their limbs because when ice forms, it's, ex it's an exothermic reaction. It releases mm -hmm. a little bit of heat. And you could see this kind of little blip of heat form in the tip of the leg, and then it would travel up the leg. And uh, not insignificant fraction of the time when they would uh, have a frozen leg, they would amputate it. So they would essentially, it would just pop off as the ice was traveling up their leg. And so yeah. Dominic was really the first one to notice this. And at first, I thought, well... I mean, they're related to crane flies. Crane flies amputate their legs. This is probably that like ice is causing kind of mechanical deformation of the leg when it's forming um, in and, and is therefore kind of activating that predator response. Yeah. Um, but then Dominic did a bunch of experiments where he would grab onto the snowfly's leg like a predator would do, do, do to a crane fly and pull on it. And then the snowflies wouldn't release their leg. It was really only when their leg would freeze that they would do it. So we think that basically they have taken what probably used to be a mechanical trigger and then switch it to be a thermal one. And we have a little bit of evidence that the way they do it is actually detecting an increase in temperature. So I mentioned that when oh, ice forms, yeah. it, it causes the release of heat. And so we've done a small number of experiments. We're doing more of this this winter where you just heat up the tip of their leg. So the experiment is basically you just take a soldering iron and tip, tip, touch it to the tip of the snowfly's leg, and then they'll amputate it. Yeah. Um, so you have a thing called the Snowfly Project. What is that? Well, basically it started out um, as a way of trying to collect more snowflies. That was the main motivation, was that there are people like us who are going out ski touring in places where there are snowflies. Also in the spirit of getting people engaged in, in yeah. doing science. Like I had the experience of my non-scientists skiing friends, getting really interested in snow flies. Because I mean, they have a lot in common with people that, that do spend time in the mountains. They're they're really rugged and do kind of masochistic things. Yeah, they're kind of the wolverines of the invertebrate world in the mountains. Yeah, but yeah cool. I, I got another meeting, so I'm gonna run. Yeah, but yeah same. Um, let's keep in touch and thanks for doing this. Yeah, thank you, John. Have a great day. Okay. All right, that's all for today. But one thing before we go, I've gotten a few questions from people asking how they can support the channel and the videos we produce. I appreciate that question. And so here are three ways that you can help us out right now. Number one, share the videos and the channel with your friends. The more people watch the videos and engage with them, the better I can justify the time and effort that me and my team spend producing them. Number two, use the comments to let us know what you liked about the video, what you didn't like, what you might wanna see in the future. Your feedback, we read all of it, your feedback helps us determine what to do going forward. And we really appreciate anything that you share with us. And number three, if you're in a position to financially support us, please do so. Funding opportunities for projects like this are surprisingly limited. And so even a small contribution can go a really long way. I'll leave information about how you can donate to the channel in the video description. All right, that's all. We'll see you for the next video. Have a great day.